Alternative or no alternative, the rift between Israel and the U.S. on Iran deepens after Netanyahu's controversial speech to the U.S. Congress. To what extent would a deal with Iran realign U.S. policy towards the Middle East? And where would it leave Israeli interests? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. After much anticipation and controversy, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has finally spoken to the U.S. Congress. Standing a mere four kilometers from the White House, Netanyahu spoke very critically of President Obama's proposed nuclear deal with Iran. In his speech, Netanyahu says a deal would change the Middle East for the worse. He says it'll pave the way for a nuclear-armed Iran and ultimately make the world a more dangerous place. Well, critics of Netanyahu say he's actually concerned the deal will make Iran a more respected power in the region, reducing Israel's influence. We'll get to our discussion in just a moment. But first, Paddy Culhane sets up the story for us from Washington, D.C. This was unprecedented, a leader of a foreign country addressing the U.S. Congress to criticize the foreign policy of their own president. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is here at the invitation of the opposition party and over the objections of U.S. President Barack Obama. My friends, I'm uh, deeply humbled. Here to talk about Iran and the ongoing negotiations over its nuclear program. This deal has two major concessions. One leaving Iran with a vast nuclear program, and two, lifting the restrictions on that program in about a decade. That's why this deal is so bad. It doesn't block Iran's path to the bomb, it paves Iran's path to the bomb. Claims the White House disputes, and the president also pushed back personally. Uh, the prime minister didn't offer any viable alternatives. Mr. Netanyahu invoked images of ISIL, North Korea, and the Holocaust, asking Congress to intervene, to stop negotiating and increase sanctions until, in his words, Iran stops threatening to annihilate Israel. More than 50 members of Congress from the president's political party boycotted the speech in protest. I resented the condescending tone. What you were witnessing today was a very old concept. If you can make the people afraid, you can make them do anything. He is a rejectionist. There is no agreement that this administration could achieve with Iran that would be good enough for him. Despite the claims that this was not political or partisan, that is exactly how it's being seen in the U.S. A controversial speech that drew protests both for and against to the Capitol. Many political analysts say this visit was an attempt to give Netanyahu a boost as he heads into his own election. It clearly alienated some members of Congress that he hopes would intervene on his behalf. Still, it's not entirely clear Congress can do anything to stop a deal. The deal doesn't have to be done as a treaty, so it doesn't have to be given advice and consent by the Senate. The president could do this as an executive agreement. In the end, it could be that the prime minister got his speech, but the president will have the final say. Patty Colhane, Al Jazeera, Washington. Well, for more on this, we're joined by our guests. Let's welcome them into the show from Washington, D.C. Geneve Abdo, fellow for the Middle East program at the Stimson Center. Geneve is also a director of the U.S.-Iran Advisory Group. From Jerusalem, Haviv Rettingor, Times of Israel political correspondent. Also from Washington, Phyllis Bennis, director of the New International Project at the Institute for policy studies. Good to have you all with us. If I could start with Phyllis, when you look at the alternatives to accommodation, is a deal, do you think a deal between the U.S. and Iran is inevitable? I think there has to be a deal. What we heard yesterday from Prime Minister Netanyahu was that the alternative to a deal is no deal, and that means a call for war, because the only deal that Netanyahu was prepared to accept was something based on Iranian surrender. That's just not going to happen. So I think there's going to have to be accommodation on both sides. That's the nature of diplomacy. When you have diplomatic relations, when you have negotiations, both sides don't get everything they want. They both fight for what they want. In this case, it's not just both, it's many sides. 
uh, and you get the best deal that you can. Well, Phyllis, but how would you respond? To be a deal. Me how, how would you respond to? I think those who support Netanyahu's line would say that he's he's urging for a better deal. It's not that he doesn't want a deal, the narrative goes, but he, he wants a better deal. Right. Well, that's what he said. He was very careful not to leave it as he has in the past to just simply say there can't be a deal. He knows that's not going to fly. So he said, as you, as you just quoted, we need a better deal. But what's his definition of a better deal? His definition of a better deal is a deal where Iran is not allowed to, to enrich any uranium, has to demolish its entire infrastructure, that's simply not going to happen. That's a deal that's impossible, and he knows that. So by saying, we want a better deal, we want a deal that we can't have, what he is still saying is, we want no deal, which means we want the right to go to war. He threatened war directly when he said that the Jewish people, and he speaks doesn't speak for me as a Jew, I got to say, but he doesn't speak for all Jews, but he claims to. He said the Jewish people will not stand by passively. That's a direct threat of war, and that's what this speech aimed to put out. All right, Haviv Gore, it is a sentiment that was expressed by Obama when he said simply demanding, I'm quoting here, this is Obama, simply demanding that Iran completely capitulate is not a plan. Do you agree with that perspective that ultimately there there is no solid alternative other than war being presented by Netanyahu to the Obama administration in dealing with Iran. I mean, it's a very simple answer. Netanyahu addressed that directly. Of course not. Let's start at the beginning. Israel has the right to go to war against Iran. It has that right because Iran is constantly and publicly and explicitly engaged in war against Israel. If Iran uh, 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 f created and, and managed and funded and trained a Hezbollah on the border of France, France would have the right under international law to go to war over that. There's no question that Israel has the right. Israel doesn't want forgive to go to war. Forgive me for interrupting you, Habib. Sorry, sorry, difficult. but forgive me for interrupting you. Couldn't we've heard Iranian officials say exactly the same about Israel by assassinating allegedly Iranian uh, scientists, undermining Iranian interests around the world? That couldn't they make the argument that they have the right to go to war? I mean, where does the war rhetoric, we have the right to go to war, doesn't that inevitably lead you to a war rather than trying to figure out a deal? No, but well, I don't think it leads you to a war. I, I think that Israel does not want a war. A war would be disastrous for Israel. Israel's capabilities are much smaller than American capabilities, for example. And, and, and Iran is a very large country. It's the size of Western Europe. This is not some simple question, equation, oh, we could just go to war with Iran. I don't think any Israeli leader wants war with Iran. What I do think happened uh, in his speech yesterday, Netanyahu, for the first time, did not demand a complete end to enrichment on Iranian soil. There was a major Israeli concession. Uh, never mind that it was hidden in a lot of uh, rhetoric, because that's how you talk in the Middle East. Uh, but there was that Israeli concession. I don't think Israel uh, uh, thinks that uh, you know there's not going to be a deal or that a deal is bad. I think Israel thinks that the way the world is going about creating this deal uh, is extremely bad, not just for Israel. It's terrible for Israel, but it's bad for Saudi Arabia. It's bad for Jordan. It's bad for Egypt. It's bad for anyone who thinks that Iran's forces, active forces engaged in Syria, Iran's active forces engaged in 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 in, uh, in Lebanon, Iran's active forces essentially supporting what's just now happening in Yemen. That that's a bad phenomenon. And if you don't want all okay. of that to come under an Iranian nuclear umbrella, there needs to be a more strict uh, international uh, arrangement. Okay, I want to go to Geneva in a second, but I can How see Phyllis is shaking her head in disagreement. Go on, <laughs> go on, Phyllis. Well, just one brief point, which is about Israel's nuclear arsenal, which nobody talks about. You know, it, 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 Israeli officials won't talk about it. Israeli, uh, Israeli journalists are not allowed to talk about it. And the U.S. Congress and, and president and everyone in power in the U.S. won't talk about it. But others will talk about it because the whole That's world knows I'm about it. To, the fact that Israel to, has I'm allowed a, to talk about it. Okay, good. Then why don't you talk I about it? About the to one to 400 nuclear weapons. Because it's completely irrelevant. I, I the Egyptians are not threatening to oh, I don't think nuclear so. weapon <laughs> against Israel's <laughs> nuclear Okay, okay. I think, I think you've, 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 the point has been made here. I want to turn to Geneva and, and ask, would a deal between Iran and the U.S., aside of the nuclear concern and issue, would it also ultimately legitimize the Iranian role and its interests in the region? Is that the, the big shift that is perhaps one of the underlying concerns for Netanyahu? Uh, that shift has already happened. 
Um, I think that that's not necessarily the primary concern. I mean, let's face it, the Iranians, the, the, in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings, the Iranians have been definitely advantaged by what's happened. I mean, this is to their advantage. They now basically dominate for, or their, their affiliates dominate four Arab capitals. Um, so the Iranians have benefited greatly from the Arab uprisings. And I think that this is part of the concern, not only for the Israelis, but also for, for Sunni societies. And I, I don't really want to talk so much about governments. I think that we, we need to focus the conversation as much about governments as it is about societies. Um, in my travels extensively throughout the Middle East on a regular basis, Sunni societies are very concerned about Shia supremacy. Iranian supremacy in the Arab world. And I think that what, what the Israelis are concerned about is that the nuclear issue has been detached from Iran's regional policies. And this is because both sides want to deal. So, so the so Obama Jimmy, administration has... Sorry, but practically speaking then, what would it mean as sort of a more favorable U.S. position, a, a U.S. position that legitimizes Iran's role in the region? What practically speaking would that mean in the Middle East, in places like Lebanon, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and so on and so forth that Netanyahu was raising to members of the Congress? Well, I mean, the, you know, let's face it, Ar Iran's role in Iraq has already been legitimized. You know, there have been two successive Shia governments. Um, and so I think that this is part of the issue. But I, I, I think that that's not really something that the U.S. can control. It's not something the Israelis can control. It's not something Arab, Arab, Arab governments can control. Because Iran now has organizations in the Arab world that have risen to power. Um, Yemen is a perfect example of this. So I don't really, I think that's a moot point. Um, whether or not Iran, Iran's power in the Middle East and Iran's power in the Arab world it, at this point is sort of moot. I think that what the focus of the conversation should be about is what, you know, what, what I Iran, how Iran is going to benefit from a deal other than its role in the Middle East, because that's irrelevant. How it's going to benefit from a deal is that it's going to get sanctions lifted. I mean, that's, that's, the, the, that's what Iran is demanding. That's what President Obama has more or less agreed to do. So I think we need to focus on the issues that are related to the negotiations, and that's about sanctions. All right, sanctions is one uh, element. Uh, Israeli intelligence services, though, according to a cable which has been leaked, says, quote, the Iran, referring to Iran, says, quote, not, is not performing the activity necessary to produce weapons. Now, I want to come to Haviv and get your thoughts on the sort of line of thinking that says perhaps the real concern in some Israeli circles is not that Iran is, is so close to the red line of deploying a nuclear weapon that perhaps Israeli leadership knows that's not true, their own intelligence services uh, say it, but the real concern is lo losing the almost exclusive influence on U.S. foreign policy towards the Middle East. It doesn't want another competitor sitting at the table called Iran. Do you think Iran is going to develop suddenly influence in Washington? I, I, don't, I don't think that's a, something that Israel fears. I don't think it has anything to do. You know, the Saudis have gotten more arms from uh, the United States. They paid for it with oil, and Israel was largely given to Israel as aid. But nevertheless, in the last 60 years, the Saudis have gotten much more military aid, uh, military uh, hardware and military money uh, than Israel has. I don't think the question is Washington. The question is very simple. It's important to get away from platitudes. It's important to get away with, you know, the Israeli nuclear arsenal. Nobody's worried about the French nuclear arsenal either, and for the same reason, it's not going to be used. The question here is not about the nuclear so, weapon. Sorry, just it is clarify, about Mr. Are, Khamenei. Are you suggesting that Israel is no longer the largest so recipient wrong. of U.S. aid? I mean, that, that is factually not correct, isn't it, Mr. Haviv? No, I said specific. I mean, it's on Wikipedia. Uh, uh, the Saudis have paid for American military hardware with, with oil money. They right. purchased so that, it. That it wasn't is, aid. That is not the equivalent of But the of, Saudis of have aid, vastly right? more. Let's, let's keep things a little clear for Well, sure, I'm not talking. Right. right. Okay, I don't think that Iran is going to compete uh, with Israel for the love of the American people 
or for the love of the American Congress. I don't think that's in the cards. I don't think we're worried about that. I don't think that's relevant. I think what's relevant here is that Iran, as, as states crumble in this region, Iran, which is one of the more competent and one of the more uh, uh, um, uh, aggressive regimes in this region, uh, uh, is filling that void. And it's a dangerous void, not because the Iranian people are dangerous, but because the Iranian people are ruled by a man who can't be unelected and, and who, has, uh, who has plans for, for regional domination, plans that he announces every day of the week. Uh, and he talks openly about annihilating Israel. Now, if Israel started talking openly about annihilating Iran, then yes, uh, we should be having a very hard conversation about whether Israel uh, uh, should be contained by the world. Uh, and that's, that's something that we need to but, be having. How no does the world evidence. contain in Iran? Okay, okay, let me give Geneva a chance, and then Excuse I can see me, Phyllis wants to get no in. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Geneva. There's no Please. evidence. There, I mean, you, you can't really, if you know anything about the history of modern Iran, you would know that their rhetoric is often meaningless. Their rhetoric is theater. Their rhetoric is part of their strategy. As someone who spent three years as a correspondent in Iran, I can tell you that their rhetoric should not be taken literally. So don't use that as some sort of argument. Um, you know, it, there is no, no evidence I'm sorry, whatsoever. they don't have an army in there Syria? There is no evidence there they, is no evidence They don't have militias whatsoever. in Iraq. They don't fund and train Hezbollah. Of course, but what does that have to do with Israel? What does that have to do with annihilating Israel? Why would you train? There is no evidence. Why would you, why would you there sustain is no, Hezbollah? Can you please right. not okay. interrupt so, uh, me? Okay, let, but, uh, okay you've made your no point, Geneva. There is no evidence. You've made your point, Geneva. Let, 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 let's give Haviv a, a chance. Sorry, go ahead. Do I get to say something? I, I will come to no, you in I, a second. I mean, okay, we could. We, I'll just say one sentence. We could ignore Hezbollah and Iran's uh, uh, sustaining and training and, and funding and arming of them. We could ignore all of the actions that we've all talked about in this conversation that Iran is actively pursuing as major national strategic, national security goals of the Iranian regime. We could ignore all of that. Uh, and we could just say there's no evidence that rhetoric means anything. But we just went through the 20th century, not just World War II. There are many, many regimes that when they spoke about killing somebody, they then went out and killed them. All and right. I happen to live in Israel. Okay. So for me, it's maybe a little let, bit more serious well, okay, of a Okay, you've made your point. Let me, let me give you. Phyllis a chance to weigh in on this. You know, I think we have to come back to something we left behind a few minutes ago, and that is the question of Iran's role in the region more broadly. And I think that we do have to recognize Iran is one of the most powerful countries in the region for a host of, of reasons. If we look at what it took to be a regional power, an indigenous regional power, not a derivative power like Israel that got its support and its weapons from outside, but a de a, an indigenous regional power meant you needed oil for, for wealth, you needed size of land and population, and you need water. Only two countries in the region had that. That was Iran and Iraq. The U.S. destroyed Iraq. Iran has emerged as the only indigenous regional power in that sense, and I think that it needs to be taken very seriously. One of the questions that we're not dealing with is what about the civil war, which has become a multifaceted regional and global war in Syria? At the root of the crisis with ISIS is the war in Iraq, uh, sorry, in Syria. And if we are serious about dealing with the war in Syria, we need to have real negotiations. That means Russia and Iran need to be at the table, the main sponsors of one side. And it means that the U.S. and Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Qatar and the other countries that are supporting the other side need to be at the table. All right. The negotiations with Iran could lead to that kind of a grand bargain, which would be in the interests of all the people in the region in terms of real security, real safety, and a real way of moving forward without being based on nuclear arsenals and war. All right, I'm I want to pick you up on the grand bargain in a minute, but since we're talking about dangerous rhetoric that can lead to destruction and conflict, it's not only Iran, of course, that's being accused of uh, launching dangerous rhetoric. And last week, you remember, Secretary of State John Kerry urged leaders to wait and see the details of the nuclear deal before passing judgment. And in anticipation of Netanyahu's visit, he also pointed out now, this isn't the first time the Israeli Prime Minister has pushed for intervention in a Middle Eastern nation based on rhetoric. Prime Minister, as you recall, was profoundly forward-leaning and uh, uh, outspoken about the importance of uh, invading Iraq uh, under George W. Bush. And we all know what happened with that decision.
Well, the testimony which Kerry is referring to is almost 13 years old. A lot of what Netanyahu's rhetoric uh, says today, though, is a little bit similar. Let's take a listen in to what he said. Did you ever see The Great Escape, the movie The Great Escape? Remember that movie? You know, where all these guys come out and they have the, the sand uh, which they distribute uh, through the, uh, the trousers while they're walking the yards. That's essentially what uh, dictators do. They can create uh, tunnels and uh, labyrinths that you'd never discover that are impervious to radar and other means. They can, uh, uh, when you have an entire country to hide uh, portable uh, centrifuges that are a little bigger than those two climbers, it's not very difficult. You can get away with it. Uh, and he has gotten away with it, frankly. And Geneve, when, uh, I mean, it's very clear there when you listen to statements coming out of the Obama administration that there is a, a dosage of skepticism uh, now when dealing with what Netanyahu says about the threat posed by Iran and so on. To what extent does that extend to members of the U.S. Congress? Do they think back to those statements we listened to from Netanyahu in 2002, where he talked about how Iraq had these portable centrifuges which they were hiding in tunnels? Um, or do they, you know, it, it seems like for some members of Congress, they feel that Netanyahu put on a pretty good show. Well, I think, uh, like politicians all over the world, uh, members of Congress have very short memories. So what they're focused on is what Netanyahu said yesterday. And I think he did a, an amazing job, a very convincing job in his performance. I mean, this is why there's so much anger coming from the Obama administration. I think that he made a very convincing case. He developed a lot of momentum here uh, in his speech. And he has, he's been very convince, convincing in terms of, of, of making the argument that Iran is a big threat. Um, and there's, there's um, a lot of momentum for that already. So he's in some ways speaking to the choir. Um, right. There is a great sense, you know, there's a great ideological split here in Washington between, you know, the, those who favor the Obama administration's policies and the other side who says, Obama is completely naive, he's dealing with the devil, don't believe anything the Iranians say. So Netanyahu is not only right. speaking to the converted, but he's gained a lot of momentum. Okay, Jenny, we've got like three minutes or maybe less left. I want to give both Haviv and Phyllis a chance before we wrap up the show. And Haviv, what is the Israeli or the Netanyahu strategy do you see at this point? I, I guess he's pretty much given up on influencing Obama and the Obama administration. Does he see a real chance to perhaps put a break on U.S. policy through the Congress? And what happens if that doesn't work either? Well, I mean, I think Netanyahu is already preparing for a Middle East under an Iranian nuclear uh, shadow. I think that uh, uh, Netanyahu is already organizing regional powers. He's called, he called in that speech. It was a remarkable thing. The first thing that he wants uh, uh, the world to link to removing sanctions. He wants a few things added to the Obama deal, a few, a few specific things. And the number one thing is that Iran stop its aggression against the Arab neighbors, its Arab neighbors. That's a remarkable thing for the Israeli prime minister to bring in his case to Congress in a speech that was very carefully put together. Uh, so I think he's already building consciously, almost explicitly, uh, an alliance with Arab powers against Iran because he feels uh, that the P5 plus one, the world powers led by the United States, uh, may actually let Iran uh, go nuclear. Let me just say right. one sentence okay. about Netanyahu's comments uh, on In 10 seconds, please, Haviv, because we've 2013. only got a minute left for Phyllis. In 10, 10 seconds, seconds, Haviv. John Kerry voted for that war. German intelligence, British intelligence, Israeli intelligence, everyone thought okay. he had those weapons. You made it's that not point. the situation Phyllis. today. Phyllis. Because 60 the seconds, is, Phyllis. We've seen the and centrifuges right now, in Iran. Right now, okay, you've had your 10 seconds. Right now, Tamir Pardo, the current head of the Mossad, has said that the greatest threat to Israel is not Iran. It's the occupation of Palestine. He didn't use those words, but he said the conflict with the Palestinians is a greater threat. I think that's what Netanyahu that's was carefully subject. trying to make sure nobody paid attention to, that it's not the greatest threat that Israel faces. What we're looking at right now okay. is a scenario where there's the possibility of changing the U.S. uncritical support for Israel by allowing for the first time for there to be this understanding in Congress, what has long been the understanding in the American people, that yes, you can criticize Israel, you can talk about ending U.S. military aid to Israel, the 23rd wealthiest country in the world, All right. why are we paying $3.2 billion a year anyway? All, right. All of that can be done without political consequences. All right, Phyllis, we're going to have time. to end it there. I'm really sorry, but we are out of time. Let's thank all of our guests, Geneve Abdo, Phyllis Benis, and Haviv Gore.
And thank you for joining us. If you've got anything you'd like to add, you can go over to our program page at aljazeera.com. You can post your comments at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or send us your tweets to at AJ Inside Story. I'm Sammy Zaydan. From the whole team here for now, it's goodbye. <laughs>